Obrigado a todos. Eu vou fazer a palestra em inglês, vou tentar falar bem devagar, o que é muito difícil para mim, embora eu seja mineiro, eu falo muito rápido. Uh, and I'm going to speak in English just because we have, you know, like our guests here, Mario and Lish, and Doug, although he understands Portuguese. Uh, I want to thank Esper for, you know, the invitation for this meeting, which is one of the, really, like, one of the best meetings that I've been. Uh, and I, it's been like two years that I participate, and I really like it. And I think that everybody that comes here really enjoy it. So um, the name of my talk is Infection for Lativirus and the Cell, formerly known as Myeloid. Um, I don't know if you understand the reference here, why I use this. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this singer here, Prince. Uh, in 1993, which is like 20 years ago, he broke up with his uh, record label, uh, Warner Brothers, and he decided to change his name. So instead of calling Prince, he called this, which nobody knew how to pronounce, and then everybody kept saying, well, it's going to be like the artist formerly known as Prince. But, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you change yourself, or if you go to another place, you're still gonna look like a drag queen, and uh, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the lesson that you learn when you change names. But I'm not gonna be talking about Prince or you know, drag queen outfits. Sorry, Esper, it's not gonna be my talk. I'm gonna be talking about um, something that happened like a month ago in Key West, Colorado. Um, a town located 9,000 feet above the sea level. There's no oxygen for you to breathe there. And just to have an idea of the temperature, um, one Fahrenheit, minus one Fahrenheit, for you Brazilians, it is minus 20 Celsius. So for four days, I was inside the freezer. And uh, although <laughs> it was not very nice in terms of health, I, it was one of the best meetings that I had in my whole life. And I'm going to talk to you why uh, I changed my mind about, uh, about a lot of cells and about how I see uh, myeloid cells. But why myeloid cells? Why am I going to talk about myeloid cells? So everybody knows that HIV does infect lymphocytes, CD4 positive. Everybody knows that, lymph that HIV also infects macrophages. We know that, but out of the, all the talks that we had here, all the talks, only 10% talked about macrophages, and some talked about monocytes. But the funny thing is, which cell is more abundant in our body? Lymphocytes CD4 or macrophages? Think about it. Lymphocytes CD4, even if you mix all the blood and, we, and all the tissues, macrophages are in every possible organ. Macrophages in your skin, which is one of our biggest organs. Liver, um, uh, spleen, um, pancreas, brain. Our brain is full of macrophages, of microglia. We have m much more macrophages in our body than lymphocyte CD4. Worse, what is more abundant during infection? During infection, you're going to have depletion of CD4, first of all. So you're not going to have CD4s afterwards. Uh, we're going to have monocytes with very high turnover. They're going to be released from the bone marrow and going to go straight to the tissue because of inflammation, becoming macrophages. We're going to have macrophages with different phenotypes, completely different phenotypes from tissue to tissue. I'm going to talk about that. And macrophages express CD4, CCR5, CXCR4, which are the receptor for HIV. Besides, they also express the CR2, which is a receptor for some strains of HIV and SIV. And among macrophages, they have a very, very long life, and they are very resistant to antiretrovirals. One of the reasons that I asked, like Renato yesterday, is because we know that at times we have to increase the doses of antiretrovirals so that macrophages can uh, fight against the, the, that infection. So the, uh, yesterday you saw Janice Clements talking about our lab. We work at Hopkins in a lab called the Retrovirus Lab. We work with pigtail macaques, and we, uh, Janice and Chris, they developed maybe like 15 years ago a model to understand the CNS disease and, uh, in the context of SIV, HIV. 
So we have like two viruses that we infect um, those macaques, and in less than three months, 100% of those macaques are going to develop AIDS by depletion of CD4, and more than 90% of those macaques are going to de uh, develop encephalitis of such, uh, of, in some way, either mild or severe. But before we worked with retrovirus or with uh, SIV, Janice and Chris, they worked with another virus called Visna. Visna is a virus, a lentivirus as well, that attacks uh, sheep and goats. Um, it's a wonderful model for multiple sclerosis. In fact, the, the sheep, they, when they are infected, they start having like a neurocognitive disorder, there are degenerative disorders, uh, and also respiratory disorders. They have like pneumonia, and they cannot even walk, and then they have to be sacrificed. Uh, in fact, I think it would be great if you guys could read more about the history of Visna, because it, those sheep were in Ireland, uh, Iceland, and they were very healthy, and then someone bought a sheep from Germany, and infected like a huge uh, flock of sheep, and that's how they found out about this virus. But the funny thing here is that Visna multiplies in macrophages. They are macrophage viruses. And they are the prototype for lentiviruses. You know, lentiviruses is just one family out of the retroviruses. And retroviruses, they have like the reverse transcriptase. But there's one thing, retroviruses, they cannot multiply in cells that do not multiply. Uh, the retroviruses, when they get the CDNA um, transcribed, they stay quiet around the nucleus and waiting for the nucleus to be um, destroyed by multiplication so that they can inter come in and, uh, and inter integrate with the genome. Lentiviruses don't need that. Lentiviruses, they, ha they have a very, very broad antigenic variation. They are able to multiply in cells. They are not dividing. And for that, they developed some kind of accessories, some like proteins, not all of them, but some, uh, the majority of those uh, lentiviruses, they have proteins that help the DNA to go from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And in the case uh, of uh, SIV and HIV, at least, I don't know if about the other uh, lentiviruses, they have another structure in the DNA called the DNA flap. It's a, a formation of three strands of DNA, which is very rare, and that's recognized by some machinery in the, in the cell together with some proteins in the virus and help them to just cross the pores and inside of the nucleus. In fact, if you just mutate that, you're not going to have the penetration of the virus in the, uh, the cDNA in the nucleus. In other words, they re replicate efficiently in macrophages, which are cells that do not multiply. Um, we have like two kinds of, or two groups of lentiviruses. The ones that are immunosuppressive and the ones that are immunostimulatory. The ones that are uh, stimulatory, the ones from uh, goats, the ones from sheep, and the first lentivirus that was discovered was 1904, the infectious anemia in horses. Um, they all multiply in macrophages, basically in macrophages. And then we have another group that multiply in macrophages and also in lymphocytes. And that's when you have the SIV, HIV, the BIV in cows, and also the FIV in cats. So why people don't talk about macrophages? And I blame Gallo for that. Gallo, you know, the guy that's the one of the, the two groups that discovered the HIV, the, the virus that causes AIDS. AIDS. The, the, the first uh, hematological findings in those patients in 1981, 1982, they had a very severe depletion of lymphocytes. At that time, I think we remember, it was called OKT4s. Uh, monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies for uh, fax, they're just starting at that time in the 80s. And when they uh, realized there was this huge depletion, they start like focusing more, well, if this kind of cell is being destroyed, let's take a look at them. And then in 1983, Gallo, the Gallo's group published the isolation of a human T-cell leukemia virus. At this moment here, you're already stamping in the forehead of this virus. It is a human T-cell virus. Um, the funny thing is that Gallo was wrong. This name is not a good name. He called HTLV-3 because we had HTLV-1 and HTLV-2, which are two oncogenic viruses. So then, in 1986, three years later, a group proved that 
they are in fact lentiviruses. So here's like a, a, a pic, uh, figure for that paper where we have the genome of a Visna and a genome of the HIV showing, in fact, it was not even uh, Visna, it was like the caprine encephalitis virus, which is similar to Visna, proving that they are very similar, much more similar than HTLV1, HTLV2. And which group was that? With Genesee Clemens that we saw yesterday. That's what I said. She was the first one to really prove that uh, HIV was not a, a knockout virus, it's a lentivirus. And I want to give you some considerations here for you to think. Everybody's seen this figure before, correct? CD4 goes down, virus goes up. Isn't something like weird here happening? If the virus replicates so well in CD4s? So why is that that we have an increase of, CD, of uh, viral replication when we don't have any CD4 in the body of those patients? Some patients have like five cells per microliter. So how, where, where is this virus coming from? So the HIV, first of all, is not the direct cause of depletion of CD4. At least nobody can prove that they really destroy CD4s in such a, a, an amount that counts for this depletion. Uh, we don't, we, uh, Rick Coop present like a very nice data how many CD4s are infected, normally like one in 2,000, one in 4,000. When you are treated, it goes like to one to a million. Um, but even if you consider the lymphoid organs where we have a lot of CD4s, we still not, it still doesn't count for this amount of virus that comes from those patients. So they, sh they have to come from someplace, and it's not CD4. Uh, other cells are involved, uh, as I told you, like macrophages, we know about that, but even astrocytes could be a source of production of those viruses. In fact, our lab proved that, uh, that astrocytes in vivo, you can detect NAF and REV, and at times you can detect you know, GP41, very rarely. In vitro, if you just infect astrocytes with the strains of SIV that also multiply in macrophages, they grow and they replicate slowly, but they do, like 30 days. Uh, SIV that are lymphotropics, they do not replicate in astrocytes. But I'm not here to talk about astrocytes. I'm here to talk about macrophages. And now I'm going to understand why I said that the macrophages may be the cells formerly known as myeloid. I love to, every time that I do a talk, I love to go back to the first paper where someone just published that and see why and how they published that. I was unable, and Mauricio, please help me to find a paper where they decide that some cells are myeloid and some cells are lymphoid. Where and when they decide on that? Who published that? I have no idea. I went back and I couldn't find. But we know what a myeloid cell is and we know what a lymphoid cell is. You talk about the, proge oh, sorry. the progenitor cells, they are like the lymphoid stem cell that makes the lymphocytes, and then the myeloid stem cells that make not just the monocytes, but granulocytes, erythrocytes. Uh, if you think about the name, myeloid means bone marrow, comes from the bone marrow. So those cells here, they come from the bone marrow already ready to work, mature. The other ones, they have to pass through another kind of organ to mature or to differentiate, like thymus for the uh, T lymphocytes and uh, uh, spleen or lymph nodes or in case of birds, like the birth of Fabricius for the B cells. But this is also changing. We also, now people are saying that some like lymphoid cells, they can become myeloid cells. Some myeloid cells, they can become like lymphoid cells. So this is all about to change. But we still keep in mind that myeloid cells are the ones that come from the bone marrow, correct? So that's so ingrained in our brain that a beautiful paper proving that, you know, like in, um, macrophages in the intestine are not infected by HIV. A very good group. The first phrase of this paper last year or two years ago was, tissue macrophages are derived exclusively from blood monocytes. Exclusively from blood monocytes. Where are monocytes coming from? Bone marrow. Okay? which as monocyte red macrophages, they support HIV replication. So then I go to that myelot meeting and everything changes. In fact, I read this paper before I went to that myeloid meeting, so I'm going to talk about like three people that are presented in that myeloid meeting, and then they're really good uh, researchers. This one here, Christian Schulz, he comes from like the Geisman group, which is like the Pope of monocytes. In fact, the name of the, the, his lab is the Monocyte Lab in the King's uh, College in London. And he published this beautiful paper showing that in mice, 
Uh, and of course, all those experiments are going to be in mice. They can do, you know, uh, GFP mice. They can be they can do like transgenic mice with or without some kind of proteins, knockout mice. They can put like two mice together. They fuse two mice with different strains. So cells from one mouse pass to the other mouse. It's called parabiotic. So they can, we cannot do that with monkeys. I don't think it would be easy to do, you know, two monkeys fused together uh, since they were fetuses. But anyway, this group here, they published that among all the macrophages in the body, so they took like, you know, macrophages, so the microglia, um, uh, lung, lung we have like two kinds, the alveolar and the interstitial macrophages. We have the liver, the cup for cells, kidney has like several populations. We have the joints, um, bone marrow, Spleen, we have like several populations of the spleen. So what he did was he started like analyzing those populations in terms of transcriptome, comparing them to some cells that were coming from early progenitor cells in those mice. And what he found out was that some macrophages, they cluster together with a kind of macrophages that would come from monocytes. But a lot of the other macrophages, in fact, the most important macrophages here, they come from the yolk sac, o saco vitellino. So when we are still a fetus, you know, the, the, you're going to have progenitor cells from the, the yolk sac. Those progenitor cells are going to migrate to the liver or straight to, in the case of the microglia, in straight to your brain. No bone marrow. Those macrophages are going to stay there. You're going to grow. And those macrophages are going to stay there forever, always multiplying inside your brain. Those macrophages are never going to come from monocytes that were originated from the bone marrow. That's when I ask you, should we call those cells myeloid now since they don't come from the bone marrow? Of course, nobody's going to change the name. But think about that. Not all macrophages come from monocytes and come from the bone marrow. And that's being proved, and people already know about that and are talking about that. And we don't know uh, the implications of that yet. So. In this paper, they showed that uh, in, from the saco vitellino, from the yolk sac, you can have all the lung cells, all the cells in your skin, all the uh, macrophages in your skin, Kupfer cells, microglia. If you uh, destroy the microglia, like they do at times with radiation in mice, and those cells regenerate, not by monocytes, regenerate by progenitor cells that proliferate at that specific spot. That's something completely new that just now people are starting to understand. Of course, all the macrophages are still coming from monocytes and from the bone marrow. And those macrophages at times, uh, the majority of times, those macrophages, uh, they happen during inflammation. So during the homeostasis, when the body is, kind of, is healthy, we, we rarely have like this turnover of monocytes going to the tissues. But when you have inflammation, we need more cells there to fight that inflammation or that infection. And that's when we have the, rec uh, the recruiting of monocytes from the, bone, from the blood, and they came from the bone marrow. This uh, researcher, uh, Gwendolyn Randolph, very bright, one of the best talks, what she did was she took all those populations different populations from each uh, organ. And she was trying to find a signature that could say, what is a macrophage? What protein all the macrophages have? Someone said, well, CD14. No, microglia doesn't express CD14. Uh, CD68, no, no all the macrophages express CD68. So she was trying to find out what's the best signature for myeloid cells, you know, quote unquote. And she found a MRTK, which is like uh, surface tyrosine kinase, and CD64, which is FC receptor, they were expressed in most macrophages, the majority of macrophages. In fact, I feel like she, uh, she, we never say all of them because you never know, but she said the majority that she saw had like those two markers. In fact, she even says that depending on the expression of those two markers, we can differentiate between monocytes and macrophages. And those results were not published yet. I'm looking for her like, for this paper, but it hasn't been published. She presented this beautiful data now another thing, she took, uh, she uh, studied monocytes, she showed that some monocytes, they do not become macrophages in the tissue. They go to the tissue, they stay there for some time, maybe hours, and they leave the tissue and go back to the blood. So, at this point, should we still think of monocytes in, as a transient cell, as like a teenager cell that's going to become macrophages? Or should we see monocytes as an end-stage cell? Maybe they have their own function. 
In fact, there is one population of monocytes. Uh, Lish talked about uh, them yesterday. Like, they are like the CD16 positive and 14 low. And that group from Geisman showed beautiful films showing that that, that monocyte, they, what they do is they, they crawl inside the vessel, cleaning the vessel, like a vacuum cleaner. They're cleaning like debris, pathogens, and suddenly, boom, they extravasate and go to the tissue. And they even said, well, maybe that monocyte is a blood macrophage or a vessel macrophage. So even the decision between a monocyte and a macrophage is kind of becoming blurred lately. And the information, they differentiate in macrophages, in macrophages and dendritic cells. And this, uh, Michael Pite in Harvard, he published a paper in 2010, I guess, a beautiful paper showing the monocytes, they can uh, stay in the spleen for a long period of time. So the spleen now is not just like a, a very important hematopoietic uh, organ, but they can also have the reservoirs of monocytes and those monocytes stay there waiting for some kind of a stimulatory um, mechanism to take them from the spleen and go to other organs. In fact, his, uh, his model is with um, infarction, myocardial infarction. And when he caused myocardial infarction in those mice, we have release of angiotensin II. This leads to a proliferation of monocytes in the spleen, not bone marrow. And those monocytes migrate from the spleen and go to wherever you know we have the inflammation. This case was so beautiful because they show like this video. If you can get his paper, he shows like this beautiful monocyte kind of like walking, 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 and disappearing inside the vessel. So monocytes can also proliferate with something that we never thought before. So first conclusion: several populations of macrophages are resident in tissues and they do not originate from bone marrow. They proliferate from progenitor cells uh, that came from you know, the yolk sac via uh, liver or not. Monocytes do not necessarily differentiate into macrophages. At times, they are just cells that go back and forth in lymphoid organs or even non-lymphoid organs. Uh, Gwendolf, uh, uh, Gwendolyn Randolph shows showing monocytes in skin where it comes in and out of the skin. So now let's talk about my work. So uh, three years ago, I started like, working with monocytes, trying to understand the population of monocytes in our model, in our macaque model. And we published that last year. Uh, we found a population of monocytes that was very weird, very unusual. Normally, monocytes, they, uh, they can be differentiated between classicals and non-classicals and intermediate. In the classical monocytes, they always have this kind of phenotype, CD14 high, CD16 negative, and CCR2 positive, because they respond to CCL2. Yes, we were discussing that with Lish. So CCR2 is very important for those monocytes. They come straight from the bone marrow, ready for a fight. And then we found that in the acute phase of SIV and HIV, those, the CCR2 is downregulated, and in some cases, almost disappear from some of those um, monocytes. Here is Erin uh, Shirk. She's my Mario Roderer. She, she's the one that does like all the facts and was a, a, the, my, one of my favorite technicians there in my lab. She did like part of this work. So monocytes, we have like 14 high, 14 double with 16, and here we have like 16 high and 14 low. Those are the non-classicals, those are the classicals. And in my case, I saw like the population of CCR2 low or negative. So my question was, oh, sorry. After you know, a lot of research, we found out that those monocytes have a function. They are immunosuppressive. They are able to do that in vitro. If you put like PBMCs together with the monocytes, you decrease proliferation of CD8s and a little bit of CD4s. And in vivo, probably, because we see like a correlation between, a negative correlation between an increase of those monocytes and a decrease of activated CD8. But then my question was, where are they coming from? Are they coming from the bone marrow? Are they mature monocytes? Are they passing through some, some kind of tissue? So what I did was, we used BRDU, which is a, which is a analog of a nucleotide that can incorporate into the DNA when the cell is multiplying, only when the cell is multiplying. So if you give like a, a, just a pulse of BRDU for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, all the cells are multiplying in those 10 minutes, they're gonna get BRDU. 
And then what you can do is you can give beard oil to monkeys, like for 20 minutes, and then sacrifice this monkey several days later, several hours later to see where the cells are or went to. And then you can do like fax or immunocytochemistry and see uh, the fluorescence by putting an antibody against beard oil. So, here was my strategy of gating. We treated the monkeys with BRDU and sacrificed them after 12 hours, 24 hours, or, or 72 hours. I took the blood, or in some cases, the spleen singlets, all like the PBMCs, and then I eliminate all the um, NK cells and all the lymphocytes like with C20 and CD3. In my case, I had to use 1659 because we don't have uh, CD56 for monkeys. Uh, separated all my classical monocytes, and then here are my classical monocytes, and here are my non-classical monocytes. You can see the DBRDU right here. They are just in the classical monocytes. In other words, after 12 hours, only classical monocytes are in the blood, not non-classical monocytes. So those are like older cells. And then when we do the composite here, we can see the non-classical monocytes. That's what I'm going to be showing now. Non-classical monocytes in blue here, and then here is the population of the classical monocytes, and here the BRDU. You can see that we have some BRDU CCR2 negative. This is not 12 hours, this is like 72 hours. So here is in the blood. So we had two monkeys for each one of those experiments. So you can see that you couldn't find a lot of monocytes in the blood that they were BRDU positive. I don't know where they went. In fact, there were like very few monocytes, and none of them was CCR2 negative. When you marked the monkeys 24 hours prior to the necropsy, we start seeing those CCR2 negative cells, and they just increase after 72 hours. So those cells here, they are not coming from the bone marrow. They are, going, they are monocytes that came with this uh, phenotype here and changed afterwards, and just uh, appear in the circulation 24 to 48 hours. But then we went to the spleen and also to the lung of those animals to see if we could find those cells in those animals. And then we became much more interesting. Uh, even in the beginning, after 12 hours, we see a lot of monocytes in the spleen. That makes sense. Those animals are infected. So the spleen is a big inflammatory organ. Those monocytes went straight to the spleen. And already, 15%, after 12 hours, it start changing the, the phenotype to CCR2 negative. After 24 hours, 30% of those monocytes already have CCR2 negative, and then almost half of them after 72 hours. The same happening here in the BALs, although we don't see a lot of those monocytes after 72 hours because I think that they already became um, macrophages. So they are present in organs before the blood. In other words, they migrated to the organ first and then went to the blood afterwards, which is uh, kind of like in parallel with the other guy published that maybe the monocytes is, are stored in the, in the spleen for some time and then released afterwards. I believe that the spleen is kind of like a barometer for change in phenotypes of cells, including monocytes. But then, because of that, because we saw that in the spleen we had so many changes, we decided to take a look more deeply in, the, in this organ. So what is happening in the spleen during infection? So what I did was I took a spleen from monkeys. They were uh, non-infected, and then sacrificed that four days after infection, seven days after infection, uh, 14 days after infection, 21 days after infection. I took RNA from the spleen and did uh, an array with a technique called nanostring and that measures mRNA. Um, here, I know that looks very confusing, but here you have the list of like 100 genes that are expressed in the, in the spleen. In fact, here you have spleen, lymph nodes, and PBMCs. My goal was not just to see that in spleen, but seeing in other organs, and even see if you can correlate genes from the spleen with the PBMCs. A lot of people use PBMCs as surrogate for what happens in lymphoid organs. I was just curious to see if that's the case. But I'm going to focus more in the spleen. So here what you're seeing is Genes, they are highly important during the acute phase because they change according to time. Genes, they are very up or down regulated according, uh, during like, the acute phase. And if the gene doesn't change a lot, it's not important for that happening, for that event, they're kind of here in the bottom. We are very, su not surprised, but we were very uh, happy, in fact, to see that the majority of those genes here, they were interferon-related genes. Interferon beta, interferon alpha, uh, MX, OS1, OS2. But then there was one surprise. 
the most important genes here. One is MXA, which is uh, co completely related to interferon beta, and the other one was CCL8. CCL8 is a little cousin of CCL2. CCL2 is the MCP1, MCCL8 is MCP2. It was a surprise because it never took any look at CCL8 in our model. And because of that, we now we started watching what's happening with this uh, chemokine. They were like the most important genes, the most important uh, RNAs modulated during acute infection. Uh, so what I did was I made like a transwell experiment to see if that's the case. In the transwell experiment, I put PBMCs on the top of a little funnel, and this funnel has a little membrane in the bottom. And then we have like a well in the bottom where we put like medium with or without chemokines. So if the cells on the top get like, you know, well, I have to pass there, I have to go to my chemokines, they're gonna go through the membrane and they fall in the well underneath. So I can take all those cells, see which ones are monocytes and what kind, or, and even count how many cells I have there. And then, so in monocytes from macrophage, they were SIV negative, non-infected. When you put like the transwell system, the majority of the monocytes, they went when we had CCL2 in the bottom of the well. But in the monocytes, they were infected at day 10. CCL8 was much more important than CCL2 for the, for the trafficking of those cells to the transwell, meaning that, that maybe CCL2 is not a nice uh, chemokine when we have infection. We might have another kind of receptor, maybe even CCR2, that is responding to the CCL8 present in the spleen. That, maybe that's why we have such like a fast movement of monocytes from the bone marrow to the spleen. Meanwhile, we are doing another kind of work in our lab. Julia Russell is uh, this brilliant um, graduate student. She was analyzing different populations of macrophages in the spleen using different markers. Uh, everybody knows the CD68 is one of the best markers for macrophages, uh, activated macrophages. But then she started using CD163, which is a scavenger receptor. This is sign, which is like a lactin, a, a lactin protein, also in, uh, in dendritic cells, and MAC387, which nobody knows what it is. Someone developed this antibody for macrophages, and nobody knows exactly what it binds to. But my curiosity was, do they stain the cells in the same place? So those here are like splints from like uninfected uh, macaques. And what she saw was that like in the, um, my God, what's the word? What's the word here in the middle of the spleen? Uh, the white pulp, but there's another word for that. Well, let's put the white pulp. The white pulp, that's where we have like the, the large amount of CD68. Uh, CD163 was spread around the spleen without a lot, uh, very like, nice localization. Now, the cis sign was around the follicle. <sighs> was around the follicle. I knew it would come to me. Uh, but not inside the follicle like the CD68. And the MAC387 formed clusters more in the periphery of the organ, but not inside the organ. In other words, we have different kinds of populations marked by different kinds of proteins that we can differentiate. And her goal now is to see what is the importance of each one of those populations. Uh, one thing that I already noticed is that when you have uninfected monkeys, untreated monkeys, or monkeys treated with heart, there was almost no change in the population of CD68 in the spleen between those two uh, groups of monkeys. But we have a big differentiation between untreated and heart-treated of CD163 in macrophages in the spleen. Uh, you're seeing like those red, blue, those are our uh, scores for the brain. So animals that develop like severe encephalitis, they are in red, and then it goes down to the ones that have no encephalitis in uh, green. Of course, the ones that were treated had no encephalitis, and here we have like the mixed population. But look how interesting it is. Cells in the spleen, macrophages in the spleen can correlate with the amount of virus and severity of the disease in the brain. So we have a big crosstalk between lymphoid organs and also the spleen. And you can see like the ones that have like more CD163 are also the ones that have severe encephalitis. And very interesting, those, uh, those macrophages that are 163 positive, they also can be infected by SIV. But there's one thing that is very weird. 
163 is a marker for alternative activation in macrophages. I'm going to talk about that like very fast now. Macrophages do not have to be classified just where they are or where they came from. Uh, depending on the phenotype, depending on the function, for instance, we have macrophages that just eat red cells in the spleen. We have macrophages that just uh, uh, make bone in our uh, make, uh, bones, the osteoclasts. So it's not just about function or phenotype. They also can have like an inflammatory profile. So with these experiments, uh, in vitro experiments, we see that if you take a macrophage, uh, I don't know if you guys know how you do macrophages, how you make macrophages. We take PBMCs from the blood. We put them in culture with MCSF, which was a very important cytokine. Uh, after seven days, we wash all the cells that are not adhering, and the cells that are there adhere that they are macrophages. Okay? That's what everybody does. I mean, everybody. So if you take those macrophages after seven days, remove the MCSF, and add interferon gamma, they become the classical activation macrophages, and they change all the receptors, and even like the morphology of, uh, after like 24 hours. If instead of MCSF or interferon gum, you put IL-4 or IL-13, you have the alternative activation macrophages. They also have completely different phenotype, completely different morphology and function. If you take the MCSF and you give IL-10 or TGF-beta, they have another kind of phenotype that's called the deactivating macrophages. So you can play with those macrophages in vitro. In fact, you can transform a macrophage in this case and then Two days later, you can stop the cytokine and put this cytokine here, and they become another cell. Macrophages are so plastic that they can change phenotypes in less than hours. So that's what we call like reprogramming. They can be reprogrammed among phenotypes depending on how you treat them. There's a beautiful paper that just jumps from IL-10 to IL-4 several times, and the macrophages kept going back and forth. So, we are curious in our, in our lab to see if the macrophages that we have in the, in the spleen, they also have like different phenotypes. And then we have Claudia Valos, she's a girl that, that just started working in our lab, a uh, 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 graduate student, and she did all this work. So in vitro, she decided to see if like macrophages of monkeys, they have the same kind of phenomena that we see in human macrophages. So she treated macrophages with LPS, interferon gamma, IL-4, and IL-10. And you can see, if it, and then she analyzed by two uh, receptors, the Munoz receptor and 163, which is like the scavenger receptor. You can see that there's almost none of these receptors if you just activate the macrophage with interferon gamma. We have Munoz, but a few of 163 if you have IL-4, and a lot of uh, double positives if you are with IL-10. So it was very easy for us to see that they can be changed. So in vivo, she took like from the spleen and she found a large population of the class two macrophages. Those macrophages are anti-inflammatory. They are not inflammatory macrophages. That's very interesting. The spleen is in an inflammation state, but the macrophages are in an anti-inflammatory state. In the lung, we don't see this double positive, very little, but we see a lot of the type 1, the, IL4, the type 2A, which is IL-4. So even organ during the infection also has different kind of phenotypes, and, and therefore some kind of function. That's Sarah Price, my new technician, and she did this work in which we asked, if they have different phenotypes and different receptors, if you put the virus there now, are they going to be infected in a different way? So we infected macrophages, depending on if it's type 1, type 2A, or type 2C, or no action, with uh, two kinds of, in fact, three kinds of HIV. Um, this NL43, which is like the most common HIV, that people say that they are kind of lymphotropic, but we saw that they can also multiply in macrophages. 24 hours later, we measured uh, the DNA, SIV DNA, to see if there was reverse transcript, uh, transcription, if it was uh, integration or not, but the formation of DNA. And we see that we have that, but it varies according to the, uh, to the phenotype. And then we have like a non-macrophage tropic that was uh, published by George Shaw, and that is, has almost no penetration in the macrophage if it is just MCSF. But as soon as you put IL-4, you can promote the entry of that, vi that virus inside that cell. 
And you can see that in that case, even copies of 2LTR, they change between those four, four types. Just comparing that in terms of amount with a macrophage tropic virus, you see that it's very different. We have like up like to 100 copies, 100,000 copies or 10,000 copies compared to just 1,000. So macrophage tropic, yes, they're much more efficient. But even in the macrophage tropic, you see that it varies the amount of virus depending on the phenotype that you put those virus in. So my question is, we keep talking about lymphocytes uh, the, of HIV not infecting macrophages. Are we working with the right macrophages? Maybe if you just change a little bit the cytokine of those macrophages, you're going to start seeing more replication. So conclusions. There is a differentiation of monocytes during infection by HIV, and, uh, and all the phenotypes uh, uh, appear in organs, including like spleen and lung. We have several populations of macrophages in the spleen, and during infection by uh, HIV, macrophages in the spleen seem to present a, a immunosuppressive uh, phenotype, which was very strange. Macrophages in vitro, uh, only with MCSF, do not reflect what may happen in the tissue. So keep this in mind. If you do experiments with macrophages, you're really going to have to study a little bit more how to study several kinds of macrophages to see which one is really related to your uh, phenomenon. And then the, the, I'm going to stop talking about macrophages. I'm going to talk a little bit about ingenol. So last year, uh, after I, uh, I came here and presented my talk, uh, Dr. Amilcar Tanuri came to me and said, look, we have a drug that may um, wake up latent virus. And do you want to try that in your macrophages? Do you want to try that in your macaques? I said, sure, just send me the drug, I can tell that. He sent me the drug and also he sent me Selena Abreu. And she's here debating with this bird here. I don't know if she's talking to him. I thought there was, I was about to put like the picture of a milker, your face here, just uh, to Photoshop there. But the, I prefer to give you like a more handsome picture, a milker. So Selena was a fantastic addition to my lab. For six months, she stays in the lab and she worked like fiercely and we had like very nice results, uh, in vitro results with macrophages and lymphocytes treated with this drug. Renato yesterday talked about this drug, if you don't remember. It comes from like a Brazilian plant called the Forba Tirucali. Very, very, very uh, common in the Northeast. Here's the, the formulation. Um, this drug was modified by a chemist called uh, Pianoski, and uh, he changed like the chains that can interfere with the function of that molecule. So we have like ingenol A, B, and C. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about the difference of those drugs. Uh, I think that we deserve like a, a, a larger talk about that because I think that's going to be a big thing for us Brazilians. Well, uh, Renato and also Peter Lin talked about the shock and heal strategy. So what is that? We have patients, they have been like treated with heart, therefore the virus is controlled by heart. The problem is that antiretrovirus they do not eliminate the reservoirs. And if you think about what I said, that we have way too many macrophages in the, uh, in the organs, maybe all those macrophages can work as uh, latent reservoirs for the virus. So the idea is that we're gonna give drugs or one drug to the patient and we're gonna try to reactivate those virus. So those viruses are gonna come out of latency so that the cells now can become visible to the immune system and be destroyed. So that's the goal. So that's the goal for Saha, for Biostradin, and Prostradin, and Ingenol in this case. What do you have to take into consideration? First, cytotoxicity. You know, those dr drugs are very toxic, and you're going to be changing in the um, uh, chemistry of all the cells, not just the cells that are infected with the virus. Um, okay, okay, so I put here like, activity of PKC, because those, cells, they, uh, those uh, drugs, they are... Uh, PKC activators, or in some cases, in terms of in the case of Saha, you're going to see uh, structural changes in the genome, so that can be very, uh, very uh, harmful for the patient. We have to consider administration. Are we going to give, like you know, injection, or are we going to give by mouth? Penetrance. If the drug is going to just go stay in the blood, it's appear, or are we going to go and penetrate in the tissues? We have to see if it's going to be efficient. 
if it's really gonna, uh, in vivo, wake up that virus, not just in vitro. And something that people don't talk about price. If you have a wonderful drug, but it's very expensive, or very hard to get from, I mean, you, it's gonna be very hard like, to also to work with. For instance, prostratin, which is very similar to Ingenol, comes from a plant in Samoa, one of those islands there in, uh, close to Australia. But it is really expensive. We don't have a lot of that plant there. Ingenol, in this case, has a lot of that, this plant in Brazil, and it could extract and prepare and modify it and give to patients. So here's some data from, uh, from Selena. In the beginning, what she did was she gave Ingenol to JLAT cells. JLAT cells have uh, um, uh, the genome, the full genome, in fact, of the virus with a reporter in the NAF gene with GFP. So it's latent, but when we give some activator, you know, you, you're going to measure the amount of uh, cells that become GFP positive. And you see that the, in, in this clone here, which is like the most sensitive clone of JLAS, they have several clones, we can see that in general, both a, uh, all A, B, and C have like very nice uh, activation compared to TNF alpha, which is our control, which is here in, in uh, purple. If you take panels from several JLATs, because one of the, the difficulties that we have now is the virus gets uh, integrated in several parts of the genome, and that's why the JLATs have so different clones. So we want to see if different parts of the genome are going to be activated the same way. And uh, compared to TNF-alpha, in general, in the, in the concentration of, I think here it was one, oscillina, one micromolar, you have the same kind of activation. So it has an activation very similar to TNF-alpha. Not only in terms of GFP, but in terms of the production of virus, because the GFP is in the NAF gene. Someone can say, well, it's activating the production of NAF, but not the production of virus. So if you measure P24 in other models of latency, other cells, those two cells, if I'm not wrong, the ACH2 and J1, they have mutated TAT. So this phenomenon is not TAT related. We don't depend on TAT for this activation. And U1 is a monocytic cell line that has also an integrated um, HIV. She did this experiment in Brazil, and she repeated that there in Baltimore, where she t uh, took cells and infected them with, uh, with the virus and added internal A, B, and C to see if the internal would control the viral replication in different concentrations and use AZT as a control. And you see that there was 80% uh, protection uh, of course, AZT was much better, but we had like 80% protection uh, of viral replication on the cells were treated with Ingenol. And you want to see why, why that's happening. So her goal there was to work with primary cells, both from macaques and humans. And in this case here, she took like PBMCs from macaques, and she treated with Ingenol A, B, and C, and we saw that there was a very high viability of those cells from 24 to 48 hours after treatment. Then she separate uh, blood from monkeys or from humans, separate like between lymphocytes and macrophages. For lymphocytes, it's just, you know, uh, uh, selection, and then we just treat it with the, the drugs. For macrophages, in fact, she didn't do selection here because we do facts afterwards. Uh, for macrophages, she grew the macrophages according to my recipe that I told you, and then she treated with the drug and collected to see receptors. And here, alteration of receptors, lymphocytes, CD4s. So you can see that, uh, look at CD4s. After 24 hours, there was a huge decrease of the expression of membrane CD4s after treatment with Ingenol. Maybe that explains why it protects against rep by replication. Also, CXCR4, we had a, a, a nice decrease, and we have a decrease uh, not that intense with CCR5. We always use like drugs at one micromolar, and the results here are ration over like non treated. And here we're comparing Ingenol. Uh, uh, a, B, C with brelstatin and prostratin and PMA. Prostratin and PMA, they are also forboesters, very similar to Ingenol. Brelstatin acts like a forboester, but it's not a forboester. But uh, it's also being uh, studied very heavily. Now, activation markers. CD25 didn't get too activated. In fact, for the Ingenols, they didn't have a lot of change. CD38, a lot of activation, but even at JADR, we have like very little activation. The most activation that we saw here was CD69. I had to put it on another uh, scale, because it was really, really high. 
Then in macrophages, we also saw the decrease of CD4, decrease of CCR5 in macrophages. So you act in lymphocytes and in macrophages, which is great because, you know, I believe in macrophages. So it's great that you'll be able to control those receptors in macrophages. And that didn't give a lot of activation on macrophages. Look, and in general B, for instance, decrease IGLA-DR and decrease CD80 which is good, that's what we're looking for, a drug that does not activate the cells, but is able to, rep to activate the virus. We took, uh, in this case here, human macrophages and human lymphocytes, and we treated with each of A, B, C, bryostatin, prostatin, and did a uh, uh, nanostring transcriptome. And in this case, we did in humans because we had a, a better uh, array for a nanostring uh, uh, for human genes. And then you can see I marked all the uh, ingenols with uh, kind of like reddish colors and then prostatin with green and bryostatin, which is not the same as prostatin, is a little bit different and, uh, in blue. And you can see that it varies depending on the drug. And even CD4 mRNA was downregulated in macrophages. CCR5 not, which I think that in the cells is just like a, a protein phenomenon, and CXR4 downregulated as well. Uh, it was very hard for me to make this figure here because we have way too many genes, so I put just like the main, most important ones with higher activation or higher, you know, like downregulation. But for instance, there was no activation of interferon type 1 genes, which is great because interferon type 1 is related to depletion of CD4s. I didn't put the, the lymphocytes here as well because the values are not as beautiful as the macrophages. Well, I'm being biased here. And then, you know, like the most important fresh from the oven now, uh, Tanuri gave the drug to this um, lab called BioQual, and they had like two monkeys that were infected with uh, SIV. Uh, 251, which is not the same, the same virus that I used, and not the same monkeys that I used, it's rhesus in this case. And uh, we, tried to, we checked if there was cytotoxicity and what was, would happen to those monkeys if they were treated with ingenol. That's the first time that someone did that. And if you do that with prostatin or brastatin, I mean, the animals die because it's way too toxic. And even like it caused like a lot of inflammation because you have to give by injection and can give a lot of inflammation in the region. Ingenol, you just drink. And then uh, Peter Lin say, oh, just pick up the, the, the plant, squeeze it, and just drink the tea. Of course, you're not going to do that. But, you know, I mean, we can do that just orally instead of injection. So what we did was we had the monkeys infected, and then we, they were in quarantine. And then we treat the, the, the monkeys with one milligram twice a day. BID means twice a day. And then collect the cells before, of course, treatment, three days and seven days later. Then we stop giving the, the drugs off for seven days and start giving the same thing now with 2.5 milligrams, you stop the drug, and now five milligrams. Five milligrams is finishing Friday, correct? So we're gonna, I don't have this data uh, yet. So we collected blood for, for viral load, for proviral load, for activation markers in cells, if the cells are alive, the monkey's alive, biochemistry, blah, blah, blah. So just the, the data here. Uh, I, you're going to see that there is like they are connected here, but don't forget that between the 7 and 14, there is like a little hiatus here, you know, or where they were not receiving the drug. So what you have to see is uh, 0, 3, 7, we stopped, and then 0, 3, 7 again, which would be like 14, 17, 21. So there was not a lot of change in creatinine or albumin or globulin. We had like an increase of glucose in the second dosage and a little bit of decay of potassium and change in sodium in the second dose. Uh, not a lot of change in the amount of uh, white cells, although we saw an increase of CD8s and an increase of CD4s for both monkeys. Uh, one thing that I didn't like in this uh, trial, and uh, Milker and Selena are also not very happy about that, is that one of the monkeys, this one here, was screwed up. I mean, this monkey was really bad. There was no NK cells, and uh, even, you know, like the, when you, Karina would have like a fit when you saw like the, the facts, because the cells were always spread, were not very beautiful. But, you know, we were able to get some results. Maybe, like, the next time we're going to have a better monkey and get, you know, more, like, concise uh, or more coherent results. But then, uh, in, this was, uh, the, the other data was done in BioQual. This was done in my lab. Uh, the percent of B cells decreased after some time in the second dose. 
Uh, neutrophils didn't change that much. NK cells, look at that. This poor animal here. But it also had like some change, but not a lot. And monocytes didn't change that much either. But what changed was receptors. We, after the second dose, we start seeing a decrease of the CD4 expression, CD4s, and the XCR4s in CD4s. We didn't see that in CCR5. CCR5, there was a decrease in one of the monkeys, but not the other one. And the funny thing is that when we stopped the drug, there was a rebound of CCR5, and it went like almost like two or three times higher. We don't know why it happened. And then when we start trading again, down regulation and a little bit of up regulation afterwards. And that's something very interesting. This, after three days, we have something, and then seven days goes, goes back to normal. Look at CD69, it goes up and then down, and then it stays down, even after you stop the drug and give more drug. So maybe you don't have to stay like for a month. Maybe this drug can be given to just for just like three or four days, one week. The same thing happened in monocytes, CD69 going up and down and almost disappearing afterwards. CD4 in monocytes was also decreased in, one, in both monkeys, in fact. But the most interesting thing for me, at least, for me, for me, those mon uh, immunosuppressive monocytes, they showed up. There was a decrease of CCR2 uh, expression. In, in the beginning, uh, when we gave it, it rebounded and then started going down again. What I want to do now is take those cells and see if they are really immunosuppressive, not just like the, the phenotype. Expression by JJDR was, uh, was changed as well in monocytes, but uh, we're not sure if this is uh, significant here and expression of CCR5 also went down in monocytes. So apparently monocytes changed more than lymphocytes with the, with the ingenol. Now, ta -da, the viral load increased in the plasma after the, second do the first dosage and second dosage. Don't forget, those animals are not treated with heart. So we were expecting an increase of viral load if you have more ingenol stimulating more of the LTR of the virus. So we have an increase of, of viral load. And then we had an increase also in the proviral load of PMCs. But I don't understand why we had like this decay here. We have to actually take a look at that and see what's happening. Uh, the goal now is to take cells that are treated with heart and then give the ingenol and see if you have uh, a control of viral application or treat those monkeys, which is we are, going to, we are already doing at Hopkins and we're going to do in the BioQual as well. And we're going to suppress those monkeys and then give the ingenol and see if we're going to be able to purge that virus. So conclusions is that ingenol has a, a very low cytotoxicity in vitro and is able to reactivate HIV late, uh, latent HIV in culture cells. Ingenol causes the regulation of several receptors and uh, activates some cells both in vitro and in vivo. Ingenol acts on lymphocytes and macrophages, although the majority of transcriptional changes were observed in macrophages. Ingenol alters the phenotype of monocytes in vivo and some of the phenotypes. And a dose of 2.5 milligrams doesn't seem to be toxic to the animals and is able to alter phenotypes and increase the viral load. So I think that there's a very big potential for this drug to be big and uh, uh, help patients to, for a cure instead of just a control of the virus. I think that's what I had to talk to you. Thank you so much for all my huge Retrovirus lab. Janice present that afterwards. We have uh, 30 people in our lab. Those in purple here are the people that uh, helped me like directly. Thank you so much for Asper, George, and Corina here in USP and uh, the monocyte work. Thank you for people from uh, University in Rio de Janeiro, Amilcar, Luis, uh, Pianowski from Kyle Lab, and Selena. I love you. I love you. Please come back to my life. Um, <laughs> And then the guys that did the nanostring analysis at Hopkins, Philem and Uraj from Johns Hopkins University. Thank you. Why, why don't you see macrophage depletion when they are infected? Or do you see? Macrophage depletion when the monkeys are infected. Yes. Macrophage don't die with HIV or SIV. Why? They don't. They do not, uh, normally, what ha kills the cells, uh, the lymphocytes, um, I don't know if I'm gonna say something stupid here, but in vitro, we see like a, 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 a explosion of virus production and then a destabilization of the membranes of the lymphocytes, and that's what causes death. In macrophage, the production is very slow, it's not very intense. If you grow macrophage, it takes 10 to 14 days to, for you to have a nice curve. It's very slow. It, the, the machinery in the cell is not as intense as in lymphocytes. 
Um, but now I'm, I'm not sure, because when I say lymphocytes, you're talking about activated lymphocytes, which also has a very short time. Uh, you know, like in PBMCs, we know that the factor cells, they are very short time. So maybe part of the death has nothing to do with the virus itself, but just because they're going to go into apoptosis. Macrophages um, uh, classically do not die with lentiviral infection. And do monocytes derive HIV infected? Yes, they do. Uh, monocyte, big controversy here. Some people are going to say no, no, no. Some people are going to say yes. Uh, but, uh, well, it's not that a lot of controversy because, yes, they do infect monocytes. I proved that. I think that Leach also see that, you know, they infect monocytes. Uh, the big controversy is that in treated people, they are unable to find infected monocytes. They are able to find, you know, like resting cells with the virus, but not monocytes. So some people think that monocytes are not important as reservoirs in doing treatment with heart. But yes, if you take like a person that has a lot of uh, HIV replication, you're going to see monocytes. The problem is that the monocytes do not uh, permit replication. They're going to stay latent. They do not have a lot um, nucleotides enough in, like, in the cytoplasm for uh, production of the virus, for production of the cDNA and then um, Replication. Normally, what happens is they stay like latent for some time, form like two LTRs, and uh, stay like integrated but not completely active until the monocyte goes to the tissue and then becomes macrophages. A very nice talk. Um, did you did you just mention how the uh, CCR2 low monocytes are immunosuppressive? Macrophages are immunosuppressive. Yes. Uh, what do we? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't. I know. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Um, suppression of CD8s and CD4s caused by monocytes or uh, myeloid-derived cells, they can be caused by three main ways. But uh, the most important is arginase production. Arginase um, depletes arginine from the microenvironment, and arginine is very important for lymphocyte proliferation. We also can have NOS and ROS uh, agents that are also going to uh, deplete also arginine and other um, um, amino acids. We, are, uh, we, we didn't do that with our, uh, with our macrophage to see which part was. I, uh, uh, my monocytes, they have more NOS than ROS. We think that that's like the mechanism. But I didn't have arginase in my ar array. And when you start doing like the PCR, it didn't work for monkeys. So, and when you try to measure arginine depletion, uh, if you use the wrong medium, like RPMI, which is filled with nucleotide, you just cannot measure anything. Thanks. Great talk. So, uh, your SIV encephalitis, how are you defining that? Is it sort of T cell infiltration? And I noticed on your monocyte uh, macrophage uh, immunohistochemistry, you know, CD163 sort of not co-expressing with MAC-387. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that in brain sections, or are you planning to do that? No, yes, we're planning to do that. Um, we measure encephalitis by, uh, we have two pathologies, in fact, three pathologists that do that blindly. We, they do like a lot of slides from, uh, from each monkey, and they spend like a day just looking at the slides and measuring the, point, the amount of giant cells, amount of perivascular macrophages or infiltration of perivascular macrophages. I don't know if they do with markers. I don't think that they do like CD68, for instance. I think it's mostly uh, the pathological, you know, like uh, changes that you see in the brain. Um, the CD163 is a very new story for us. We were not paying attention to it until, you know, until uh, Landay published that paper with 163, and we started noticing that 163 was very important also for immunosuppressing um, macrophages. Uh, we have like those uh, the um, these lights, and they were about to be done, but we haven't done that yet. We did like with the spleen first, but not with the brain. Well, muito obrigado, Luz. Obrigada, Luz. <laughs>